Good evening. My name is Tim Neff, and I'm the Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum, located in Pen uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'd like to welcome you to our monthly program called Spotlight On. It takes place the second Thursday of each month, where we explore a different topic related to our mission at Soldiers and Sailors. And I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight's program is going to be very special. We're going to be looking at Abraham Lincoln here in just a few minutes, and some of the objects that we have in our collection related to uh, President Lincoln and uh, some of the uh, interesting things around our building that pay tribute to the 16th president. Um, but before we jump into that, just a little bit about Soldiers and Sailors. If you are new to us and this is the first time you're watching, I want to uh, first of all thank you for joining us, but tell you a little bit about Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, as I said, it's located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was built in 1910 to honor the 25,000 men from Allegheny County who fought in the Civil War. Uh, and uh, today it stands as a memorial and a museum that honors veterans from all wars, Civil War through present day. And our hallways are filled with exhibits that have artifacts that have been donated to us through the years by veterans and their families. And we use these objects to honor their service and to tell their story. Uh, it's a very unique place. If you haven't been there before, I highly encourage you to come visit. Uh, if you've been there before and it's been a while, we encourage you to come back and see us. Uh, I'll have more information about how you can learn more about Soldiers and Sailors and how to visit and some of our program at the end of this uh, program tonight. But if you ever have any questions about us, it's always best to visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org. And that'll give you all the information about how to visit and upcoming programs and uh, programs like this, which is our Spotlight On, as I said, which takes place the second Thursday of each month. As usual, we have uh, question and answers during this program. If you're uh, watching on Facebook, all you have to do is submit a comment and we'll see your question and take care of that at the end of the program. If you're watching on YouTube, you do have to email us at soldiersandsailorspittsburgh at gmail.com and um, we will either get to your question tonight or we'll respond to that email with an answer uh, as, as quickly as we can. Tonight's program, of course, will include myself, as I said, Tim Neff, Director of Museum and Education, and also joining me tonight is Michael Krauss, our Curator of Collections. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good, Tim. How are you? Good, good. We're enjoying some unseasonable weather here in Pittsburgh, which mm -hmm. is wonderful, and uh, we'll take anything we can get in the month of February in the city of Pittsburgh. And uh, tonight, uh, as I said, we'll be looking at Abraham Lincoln, and uh, this is going to be an exciting topic. We have not touched on this before. A lot of new stuff that we've never talked about in our Spotlight On series. And uh, one of the things we're going to start with is something that I think is very uh, um, notable for people who visit us. I think a lot of people recognize this right away when they step into our beautiful auditorium. And uh, what we're seeing here is kind of a fisheye lens view at our 2300 seat auditorium at Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, that has been used through the years for all kinds of events like concerts and graduations and, and lectures and things like that. Um, but what you can't help but notice whenever you're in our auditorium is up above the stage are the words of the Gettysburg Address. So this photo is just kind of putting everything in perspective. I wanted to show this first just to give you an idea of how large the space was and in turn how long, how large the, uh, the address is up above the stage there. I think if I go to my next slide, we'll see kind of a little bit of a blown up version and you can see the uh, the address painted. That's a painting you're looking at there. That is canvas stretched uh, across the wall there. And all of that is uh, hand painted up there as a tribute to the famous words of Abraham Lincoln when he gave his Gettysburg address. What else can you tell us about this, uh, Michael, this, this feature of soldiers and sailors? Well, uh, first of all, um, you know, we all know how important the Gettysburg address is um, to understanding the Civil War. But when Lincoln gave the speech, it was kind of minimalized. A lot of people didn't like it. They couldn't hear him. It was uh, reprinted in several papers. People were criticizing him that he didn't speak enough. The speaker before him spoke for over an hour, Edward, Edwin Everett. Um, so it became, it, it repopularized right about um, the time of the building of Soldiers and Sailors in 1910. Uh, looking back at the war and in and, and Lincoln, um, the speech kind of bubbled up and became really a part of our American vernacular. So to have it be part of our building is pretty significant because Civil War uh, veterans built the place and it was something that really defined their service, what it meant, what it meant to sacrifice for your country, not only in the Civil War, but continuing um, through all our wars. But I might say that it wasn't the first choice 
of the um, of the design committee, Henry Hornbossel, the architect, had kind of specified he knew this space was a focal point. He knew it was really big, um, and he also was um, interested in seeing something um, commemorating Lincoln being up in that space. And he suggested that it be a giant mural of the life of Lincoln, kind of like what you would see if you walk into the Senate chamber or the, 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 in, in Congress in the rotunda, those giant murals. Um, but he had only left a small budget uh, in the end for that painting. And um, the board of uh, directors uh, didn't feel they could afford uh, they could break out of the budget to, to get that painting painted. So um, this was a uh, actually, I think, a, a more tasteful, um, more tasteful choice than a big mural. And it suits our needs. And it really when you sit in that auditorium, you cannot help but look at that and read it. Uh, there's just no way you can't be exposed to those words while you're sitting there. And, you know, I've watched a number of politicians and entertainers and you have two Tim that come in and first thing they'll say is they'll look back and say you know like I can't believe I'm standing here under these words I mean you know the, this is a they'll pay tribute to, to the fact that it, it's actually up there so it really is the 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 heart and soul of 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 uh, what what the Civil War is about and it's the heart and soul of our building yeah, I mean, I see it all the time with tours that we bring in there. That's always where we start the tours. And I love hearing kids start to read those words uh, and recognize, you know, where it's coming from. I think in many ways, it was almost uh, fortuitous that they thought of this in terms of they knew people would be coming to this auditorium for many different reasons through the years. But this at least grounded them in the true meaning of our building, the or origins of our building as a, a Civil War memorial. Uh, Unfortunately, it doesn't work as much anymore. Oftentimes, I have to ask the parents in the room anymore how many people have memorized this speech. But uh, usually when I ask that question, uh, most of the parents, because uh, there were generations of school children that were expected to to memorize the Gettysburg Address. So I totally agree, Michael, how, you know, maybe it wasn't the first choice, but it, it sure, turned, sure turned into a, a great choice uh, in the long run. And I will point out it is measured at about 70 by 18 feet. Um, and uh I don't think we're as bold to say it is the largest depiction of the Gettysburg Address, but it's got to be up there. If, if it isn't the largest, it's one of the largest depictions of the Gettysburg Address in the country. So uh, like we keep saying, what a focal point. And uh, if you haven't seen this, it'll be one of the first things you'll see when you walk into our building and go straight in into our auditorium. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, first thing we wanted to look at here. The next one we have. Uh, also dates back to the origins of the building, and that is this uh, bust of Abraham Lincoln that was done in bronze and uh, has been in the building since its uh, opening in 1910. Uh, what can you tell us about this one, Michael? Um, it's a very, um, very well-known rendition of, of Lincoln's face. It was done by an artist named Volk, V-O-L-K. Um, he actually met, um, met Lincoln through uh, his wife, Mary Todd, and 1858, that's two years before Lincoln became president or ran for president in 1860. And he asked Lincoln um, to sit down so he could um, uh, make a casting of his face. And that was a typical uh, way that artists approached portraiture in those days was they would make a life mask. They would coat the, 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 the sitter's face in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, like a Vaseline mixture, very thin oil, brush the hair back and, um, and then paint plaster on the face and pull it off. And, and when they pulled it off, it was a negative. And then they would make a positive casting of that and they would have a they would have his face. So Volk made a, a, an 1860 version of that. And then he created from that uh, actually several statues. And this is the, the first one. And we know it's been here since um, the opening build of the building. I couldn't find, we have a picture somewhere of several Civil War veterans standing around it, mounted on the same podium that it's mounted on here. And it once stood right as you walked into the building uh, through the front doors as a medallion like inlaid in the floor and it stood there. And if you notice um, the tip of his nose is a little bit browner than, than the rest of the, the, the sculpture. And um, that's because people used to rub his nose for good luck. And they, they rubbed the patina off of it. Patina is a, 
uh, is a forced uh, chemical reaction that's put on bronzes to make them, uh, to darken them. Um, so, so it was actually rubbed through the patina and was shiny at one time. And I put um, a picture, we added a picture on the left of Lincoln that was done um, around the same time the bust was. So you can see his face, it's about 1860, beardless. He didn't grow a beard until he uh, became president. And um, you can see, you know, the strong features, the very strong cheekbones uh, in the uh, orbits of the eye, uh, receding hairline. He had very large ears. Uh, they made fun of him in the press uh, for his large ears. And um, you also notice the, uh, like the mole he has on the side of his cheek. That's a, a pretty prominent feature. And you'll see it um, through photography of him uh, up to the time of his death. And Lincoln was photographed quite a bit for, for people in those days who may have only had one or two photographs taken. Lincoln may have had a uh, hundred photographs in his life taken. And they're all very revealing. They, they really show him aging as, uh, as he passes through his presidency. Yeah, I think um, I think I read, Mike, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this was actually presented by the Sons of Union veterans to soldiers and sailors. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. You're right. There's a plaque on it that says it's presented by the Sons of Union veterans. Um, yeah, and that's kind of cool because they still meet in our building. That organization, you know, you know, a couple generations later still meets at soldiers and sailors. So that that tie is still there. Um, yeah. So, you know, definitely one of the the, the first kind of, if you want to call them artifacts, <laughs> you know, that we that we had mm -hmm. at the at the building long, long before Soldiers and Sailors was ever thought of as a museum. Uh, and this this dates back to the those early days. So uh, beautiful piece. It is on display in in one of our exhibits uh, at Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, of course, behind glass now, so you can't come up and mm -hmm. can touch the nose any longer. No more rubbing his nose. <laughs> so then we so, jump. Um, go ahead. Yeah. And we jumped to Lincoln's visit to Pittsburgh. And uh, I, I forgot to mention in the beginning, of course, the big reason we're doing Abraham Lincoln this month is because he was born in February. He was born on February 12th, 1809. Uh, of course, we have President's Day that is uh, a way to, to honor that along with Washington. Um, but then the other kind of connection, which I didn't really think of when I when we came up with the topic, but was Lincoln's visit to Pittsburgh. He, he really only made one visit to Pittsburgh and that was in February of, of 1861. Uh, so what can you tell us about that visit, Michael? Yeah, he was on his way from Springfield to Washington. You know, he's the newly elected president and he came by train and he made these, you know, for lack of a better word, whistle stops in, in various cities. And um, he came to uh, what was then known as Allegheny City, which is the North side. Um, he was, he took a carriage ride. He, he came with his wife and two, ch two children, uh, Tad and Willie. And the, you see uh, Mary Todd and Tad and Willie there. Willie's the small one. Tad is the, the, old, the taller one. Um, they traveled by carriage um, through the north side, across one of the covered bridges into town. Um, and they, they went, we'll see it in a minute, to a, a hotel called the Monongahela House, where they stayed. And Lincoln made... Um, a speech there. Well, he, there was a large crowd. It was February, rainy, cold. Um, they, there was a large crowd to greet him. And um, he went inside and then um, came out on a, there's a balcony and he, he gave a speech, um, which is funny because in all these cities where he stopped, it's almost the same speech. He just changes and adds a reference to Pittsburgh in it. And, uh, but, but he was here in 1861. And um, I think we're going to see a little more about that story. Yeah. So if you look, um, if you're a Pittsburgher, you know what's called the bathtub, uh, which is um, a feature on one of the highways that that um, that cuts through Pittsburgh. And it runs right along uh, the um, Monongahela. Is that the Monongahela? Or is that the yep, Monongahela? That's Monongahela. Yeah. Yep. Right along the Monongahela River. Um, and it goes into town or it splits to the south or goes north. But that roadway is right there. See where the, the, the steamboats are all nestled up there? It was called the wharf. It was, it was actually a place where steamboats uh, coming up the Mississippi would, would pull in and, and put their nose into the wharf and people would disembark. They'd lay out a wooden plank and they'd go across. It was muddy, dirty, um, hard to access. It, it flooded just like it does today. Um, 
it, it was, uh, but it was the only way to get in off the boat. So when you got off there, the large building, there's a bridge to the right. That's the Smithfield Street Bridge, the one of the first uh, um, versions of the Smithfield Street Bridge. But the hot the large building at the front of there, that's the Monongahela House. And that's where all people who were traveling or, or had any money or any prominence presidents stayed there. Um, a lot of Southerners uh, coming from the South to do business in the North would stay there. Many of them bringing um, enslaved people with them to, to watch their children. Um, uh, but the Monongahela House was first uh, built in 1832, uh, enlarged a bit, and um, it, it burned down in the 1930s or torn down in the 1930s. We're going to see a couple more pictures of it. Yeah, here. we have a bit modern, more modern photo. Yeah, I think it burned down prior to the Civil War, actually. It did, it you're right. Rebuilt right. to this version that right. uh, would have been uh, the, the more version that Lincoln was at, because you can see there the little balcony. It's a little hard to make out, but if you know what you're looking for, kind of right above the streetcar to the right, you see a little balcony that protrudes. And if I'm correct, that's where he delivered the speech from. Yeah, right? you're right. That's where he, he stood out on the balcony, waved to the crowd and made his speech from up there. Um, but it, it's a it's a fascinating uh, it's fascinating to look at these different views because they're, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century. So you see a few cars. The uh, the wharf is out of scale. I mean, the, it wasn't that close to the Monongahela House on the left-hand view. And on the right-hand view, you see just this uh, entanglement of elect electric wires running down, um, which is, you know, the introduction of electricity. And there's a horse-drawn cart and some some boys standing there. But you can clearly see the balcony on the right side of the building there. And that is where Lincoln spoke from. Yeah. And, it, and it, as you mentioned, it, it was a, a prominent place uh, probably the most prominent hotel in Pittsburgh. Presidents, I think I read Mark Twain, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Dickens stayed there. Uh, but after Lincoln stayed there, the room that he stayed in became known as the Lincoln Room or the Lincoln Bedroom um, that uh, I guess people could, I'm sure, pay a little bit of a premium to, to stay in that room and more specifically even stay in the bed that he slept in. Uh, which we see here. This is depicted in the bed, actual bed in the Monongahela house we're looking at here, right, Michael? Yeah, the picture's taken in the 20s um, of the Lincoln room with the Lincoln bed, um, which may or may not be the bed he slept in. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a, a little bit of folklore. It's in the room. And um, in my opinion, it, it, it dates a little bit past that, but, but we'll roll with the popular uh, story that that it's the bed that Lincoln stayed in. So when they tore the Monongahela house down, uh, the bed was salvaged, uh, dresser, a few articles that were in the room, and um, they were stored um, in South Park. Uh, there, there was a historical society there, and um, they had pledged to um, to create a room, a, a mock-up of the room with the bed, and it was it was never completed. So the bed and furnishings were lost for a long time. They just kind of disappeared. Nobody knew where they were, or what happened to them until um, some workmen were working in one of the storage areas at South Park. And you know what they found? <laughs> they found the bed and the furniture. It was all taken apart. It was not in great shape, but they found it. And um, want to go ahead? Yeah. And I, I just want to point out I, uh, one of the things I read about the bed or, or actually I think I, I heard uh, you know, it was about six foot four long, and that's about how tall he was. So it would have been a, a tight fit uh, for Abraham Lincoln, as we all know, uh, a, a taller individual for the time. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to your point. Yes, it disappeared for a while and then was found and reassembled. And here it is on display at Soldiers and Sailors some years ago. Yeah, we were lucky enough to uh, be the first place it was displayed. Um, we put it together. Um, I had to rebuild some of the furniture, the washstand. There was a marble top um, uh, table there. There's an armoire where uh, in those days there weren't closets in rooms. There was a cabinet called an armoire and uh, people would hang their clothes in them. Uh, the there was a chair. All these pieces um, came from the Monongahela house from the Lincoln room. And we were the first people to be able to display it and after, uh, it was displayed at Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, it moved to Heinz History Center, where um, I don't know if it's on display now, but they it was for a while, and they have it in their collection. 
Yeah, it's currently at the Heinz History Center. Uh, comment or question came in from Rich Condon. I, good to see you, Rich. Thanks for joining us tonight. And yes, it is currently a part of the uh, Heinz History Center's collection. Uh, what you're seeing here is our boardroom. We had it on display in our boardroom, which was really unique because if you know Soldiers and Sailors, our museum really uh, takes, uh, uh, you know, lives on the first floor of our building. But for a short period of time, we had this up on the third floor in the boardroom. And if you just notice, I'll give a little, uh, uh, little Easter egg here. Up in the top right corner of that photo is a, a little uh, uh, glimpse of something we'll talk about later on, which is a relief of uh, uh, Lincoln's profile. So you can just kind of take note of that and keep that in mind as we move forward here. But it was a real honor to have this. And we had a lot of visitors come uh, just to, to see the bed when it, when, what was this? That's got to be about 12 years ago now, right, Michael? When I was going to ask you if you remember. Yeah. yeah. It had to be at least 12, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful bed. It's carved in walnut. Uh, um, it's the pieces are gigantic. It's American walnut kind of, you know, prime forest walnut that's dense and, and beautiful and has burl inlays and, carvings and you know just as a as a bed a mm -hmm. piece of american furniture it's pretty remarkable and it just comes to mind i, I don't want to dwell on this too long but it's interesting that it's not the first thing that got lost for many years and then found and and then came yeah. in soldiers and sailors thinking of the bow of the uss pittsburgh for example that mm -hmm. kind of turned up in a warehouse and ended up in in soldiers and sailors and still resides in soldiers and sailors so Pittsburgh might not have been the best at always keeping track of everything, but at least they didn't throw anything out. <laughs> they yeah, came, came they up later could, on. If there was a place to stick it, they stuck it there. Yeah, right. Uh, so the next uh, thing we have is a, an engraving on the outside of the building. Uh, when you walk up to Soldiers and Sailors, we all know our grand entranceway. Um, you know, we have the columns across the front of the building or above our front door. Um, we have the the soldiers and sailors. Actually, it just says Soldiers Memorial Allegheny County up there. Uh, and then on either side are these kind of tablets almost, if you will, with these engravings on them. And on the left side, when you're looking at the building from the front, is this uh, a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it's literally in quotes. It says Abraham Lincoln at the bottom. However, from all my research, and I think, Michael, you've dug into it as mm -hmm. well, we cannot find an exact match to this quote. Uh, it's actually pretty unique that this was chosen to be you know, such a prominent feature of soldiers and sailors. Uh, if you just bear with me here, I'll read the quote that as it stands on our building. This is what we're looking at right now. In case you're having trouble reading it, it might be small on your screen here. I'll read the words uh, as they're engraved into our building. The war for the union is the people's conflict to make certain whether there shall be preserved in this world that form and substance of the government, the object of which is to remove obstacles from the pathway to all, to open avenues of honorable employ employment for all, and to give to all an unfettered start and fair chance in the race of life. That's how it's quoted on our building. And, uh, you know, I'm sure these are uh, probably things that have been used in other speeches and, and maybe even little, you know, combinations of words that Lincoln has used through the years. The closest match that I could find uh, digging into it was uh, a message to Congress that Lincoln delivered on July 4th, 1861. So if you can read what's on the building, you can kind of follow along and see where the, the differences occur between this actual quote taken from Lincoln's message to Congress in 1861. This is essentially a people's contest. On the side of the union, it is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and stub substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and fair chance in the race of life. So a lot of similarities, but also some differences there, but the essence is there. And, and Michael and I were talking before the program how obscure it is that this was the this is what was plucked you know this the, these words are somehow curated and and plucked out of out of this speech to to be engraved into the building here on the front uh i think it speaks to how important lincoln is i mean we're finding that out right now to uh, uh with the address painted in the um auditorium the, the the bronze statue in the front hallway and this this tablet on the outside of the building uh, i don't know michael is there anything you wanted to add to that before we move on 
No, only that, uh, you know, I'll back you up that I tried hard to find the exact quote and uh, have never found exactly the, the quote. So yeah, it, it, they, they, they did pull it from somewhere or, or, uh, or, or created it from parts. Yeah. Unless the, created it out of uh, some of the, the themes there that he's been using in, in different mm -hmm. times. So then we have uh, this this image of Lincoln and his cabinet. This is a, a very famous image. By no means is this something that's unique to Soldiers and Sailors' this collection, although we have a beautiful framed um, you know, print of it. Um, but this is, of course, known as Lincoln and his cabinet, his team of rivals, uh, as it's become the known as. And uh, the reason we chose this, I think, Michael, is First of all, we have this image in our collection in a beautifully framed piece. And also they have a, a unique connection with Edward uh, Edwin Stanton, who was the Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln and, and spent some time in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, he uh, practiced law here and uh, had um, several important cases. And um, um, I believe he lived here for a while, too. I, I don't know exactly the dates, but uh, he was he does have a, a tie to Pittsburgh. That's him on the left. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read, uh, I think I looked up, he, he came to Pittsburgh in 1847 to, to start that law practice mm -hmm. uh, and then spent some years here. He was born in Steubenville, Ohio and, and kind of outgrew Steubenville and, and ended up here in Pittsburgh and then mm -hmm. would go on to uh, serve uh, in Lincoln's cabinet. And then afterwards, um, I, I don't think he became, he certainly didn't become a Supreme court judge, but he, he rose up the ranks pretty high there. And uh, his, his death uh, prevented him from, maybe possibly becoming a Supreme Court justice at one time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that's like you said, that's him on the on the left there. And uh, one thing he's also known for is organizing the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about the assassination. You can't talk about Lincoln and not talk about the assassination. Uh, and he was a big part of the the manhunt that that tracked down and, and killed John Wilkes Booth. So this this uh, this uh, print is. Um is made from a, a large painting that was painted uh, at the time. Uh, you know, it's uh, apocryphal and in representing the, uh, the uh, emancipation, but all of Lincoln's cabinet is there. Like you said, there's a number of notables um, and they all posed for it. And Lincoln, uh, Lincoln thought this was a, a very good representation, um, not only of the others, but of, of him. He, he, uh, he, he kind of liked the portrayal of, of himself in this painting. And um, after his death, it was uh, turned into a print and marketed. But I, I believe the original uh, may be in Washington. It's a very large painting. Um, I should have double checked that. Um, but uh, uh, it's um, if you know the characters, there's uh, Seward and Wells and, and uh, Stanton, of course. And, Chase, uh, I think, is there. Chase, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, just about everybody's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Seward was wounded in the assassination attempt. He's the man in the front with the profile. Um, interesting story he has. Okay. And then I think the next thing we have is what I kind of teased a little bit earlier. And that um, is a, a piece that's up in the boardroom, uh, which, like I said earlier, kind of doubled as Lincoln's bedroom for a short time. Um, but what can you tell us about this uh, beautiful piece of the profile of uh, Abraham Lincoln here? Well, it's a large bronze, um, large. I mean, it's probably two feet uh, in the diameter um, if you're cutting across. Um, it's in like, uh, you know, a Beaux-Arts style. Um, and usually we see bronze that is uh, patinaed, like we saw the uh, Lincoln bust where they're brown or verdigris or uh, darker colors. And this is this is polished, so it's very bright and polished. Um, <clears throat> it's the 1863 portrait of Lincoln. Um, we show it on the left, uh, the profile. Um, of course, it's flipped facing the other way. But it was really interesting when the first time, we, we thought it might have been made um, um, <clears throat> by uh, um, Brenner, the, the artist who did the Lincoln Penny. In fact, our old director, um, would often say that it was a Brenner relief until we got up one day and I took a closer look and um, signed on the bottom margin, it says um, Sue Watson. So uh, it's a, it was a woman artist. Um, we found her as um, one of Henry Hornbostel's cadre of, of craftspeople that he had who would uh, 
would execute uh, pieces for the buildings that he made. So significant that it's a woman artist that made this back in the, you know, early 1900s. I, it, it was probably installed uh, uh, in the 19, 19, we opened in 10, but the room was appointed around 1912 or 13. So that most likely is when it was, when it was done. And, uh, you know, um, it is obviously the, the, the profile and you can see the source that it comes from. And again, that's an 1863 portrait of Lincoln. And keep in mind, so far we've shown you the 1860 and now we're uh, the 62 at the proclamation. Now we're at 63. So we're moving through Lincoln's presidency and, and images of him as we go, go on here. Yeah, and I think the penny was done in 1909. So you can see where, you know, it's all kind of coming together uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of it and, and you know, is all based off of that source, like you said, and that's a, the Brady photo of 1863. Yeah, in 09, you mentioned it already, was Lincoln's, uh, 1809 was his birth, so it was the centennial. Yeah, it was the 100th anniversary of his birth, mm -hmm. yeah. Then we're kind of, like you just said, moving in this timeline, moving through his presidency. And uh, this is the the life mask that's uh, in our collection now. We, you've already mentioned that there was a life mask done earlier that that led to the Volk bronze. But this is a later life mask that, that we have on display as a part of our collection. Yeah, and this one um, uh, has been, uh, people look at this and they think it's a death mask. And what death masks were was a lot of times when uh, somebody famous uh, died, they would call in an artist and they would make a casting of the face and uh, a negative negative mold and then make a casting. Um, and this is, not a, this is not a death mask. This, again, is a life mask. It was done in March of 1865, um, in the, as well as the portrait over on the left. And we can see how much Lincoln has aged from 1860 to 65. Uh, during his presidency and during the war, uh, Lincoln got very little sleep. He was kind of uh, kind of uh, tortured by the war and stayed up uh, nights and waited for telegrams and um, was very uh, uh, was very emotionally connected to the soldiers in the war. Also, the difficulties he had with the cabinet and and passing um, uh, war legislation. Um, and during his presidency, uh, Willie, the, the, the youngest child we saw in the early photograph, died um, of, of some kind of um, uh, where they think he had uh, was uh, sick from the bad water in Washington. He got sick and and died in the white while they were in the White House. So that was very hard, not only on Abe, but on uh, his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, they both were very very struck by uh, Willie's death. And, you know, if you look at his face, you can kind of see it. But what's really unique, and we point this out to our visitors, is when you look at that mask, um, you're looking at Lincoln's face. You're not looking at a rendition of Lincoln or what an artist like, uh, like Volk took his life mask and then positioned it somewhere and then made a, a clay sculpture based on the life mask with his interpretation, but this is actually Lincoln's face. So you can see the mole, you can see his eyebrows, you can see the wrinkles in his face and the size of his ears. It's, it's very remarkable to look at. Um, and it's, um, um, it, it is a true treasure. Now, the original is in the Smithsonian and the, there were a small number of these made uh, around 1917 from the original. That's what, that's what ours is. And, um, uh, you can, there are subsequently, like now you can buy knockoffs of them, uh, but they're not as old as, as this and not as close to the first generation life mask um, as, as the one we have is. Yeah, I mean, it still was made from the same mold and, uh, mm -hmm. that was used to make it. And, and if you visit Soldiers and Sailors and you see the, the Lincoln exhibit that we have, we have the, the Volk bronze on one side and this on the other side. And man, when you see those together, uh, you, you see the aging, like you said, Michael. I mean, yeah. it's kind of really striking uh, to see, you know, what the, the toll that the presidency, the war, all presidents age in office. And this yeah. is just a, a, a really visual uh, depiction of that with Abraham Lincoln when you see this exhibit in our museum. And you mentioned this was uh, going to be in March of 1865, which means 
unknowingly, uh, he doesn't have much longer to live. Uh, he's going to be, you know, about a month later, he is going to be assassinated. So this is, you know, I, uh, like you said, as close as you can get to what he looked like, his direct features and what he looked like when he was assassinated right at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And we go to the next one. We'll talk a little bit about that. And this is the, uh, the rocking chair in that exhibit that uh, is a replica of the uh, chair that was in Ford's theater, but a pretty unique replica, I, I should say. Right, Michael? Yeah, there in the uh, early 1970s, the, uh, um, they made uh, a very limited edition of an exact copy of the Lincoln rocking chair that he sat in in Ford's theater. Uh, and, um, and Booth came behind him and um, shot, fired a shot behind his left ear. But, uh, you know, it's really, you get a kind of a sense for um, for not only the period of the furniture, but, but what he was sitting in, um, in his last uh, conscious moments of life in this uh, chair. The original um, is, uh, um, it was a Greenfield Village um, in Michigan for a long time. I know they used to let people sit in it. Hmm. I, I know people my age, when they visited as children, that they were able to sit in Lincoln's chair and it was blood stained and, and it was just crazy that they let that happen. But um, um, I believe it's still there. Um, uh, Henry Ford purchased a lot of Lincoln's uh, Lincoln pieces, including his, his house in Springfield and moved it to Greenfield village. So um, the, the chair does exist. Um, um, and I, and I, it might be at Ford's Theater. I'm not sure now, but I know it was at Greenfield Village for quite a while. Yeah, I saw it a few years ago at the Ford Museum, which is connected, okay. you know, just adjacent yeah. to the yeah. um, to the Greenfield Village. And uh, yes, it is behind glass now. You can't sit in it any no. longer. But uh, yeah, I, I, people I, used to pick threads off of it. <laughs> yeah, I, and I got to see it after you had brought us this one. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I kind of knew what I was looking at when I, you know, I could already picture it before I'd seen it, but, you know, obviously it's amazing to see the real thing. And uh, I always think it's interesting when you talk about this, that, you know, were, were people buying this and the, the, you know, <laughs> to, to put in their house, this, this, you, what a, what a weird item you'd want to have in the house, yeah. a, a replica of the chair that, you know, our 16th president was assassinated in. Yeah. Well, there's a whole, uh, a whole, whole category of chairs in the antique business they call Lincoln rockers that are all, essentially like this, like a very low rocker that are um, like with cut out arms and, and walnut. But uh, this is the tufted upholstery is exactly like the original. And yeah, they were licensed and made as exact copies. Yeah. And you can see sitting on the chair there, we'll get a nice close up in this next slide is a is a Derringer pistol, which is uh, similar to the, the type of pistol that would have been used uh, by John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, of course, it's not the original, and that that original is um, in, at Ford's Theater in the in the display. Um, it, it's a, a you know we we think of a of a Derringer as like a, the size of a pistol, but um, they were actually attributed to a, a Philadelphia maker. His last name was Derringer, and he made all all kinds of um, sizes of these small concealable pistols. And this one is a forty four caliber which is a pretty big round for that tiny little barrel. And, uh, you know, to be, be hit with a 44 caliber bullet in the head at point blank range, there's really, there's really um, no way to survive that. The bullet didn't exit Lincoln's brain, it stayed in his head, um, but um, that is an exact copy of the pistol that Booth used. Yeah, and it, you also have to take into account the the abilities of medical prof, prof, uh, professionals at the time. Uh, certainly yeah. had no chance to to save him with some of the techniques that uh, they would have been using at the time with that kind of a close range shot. Even today, it would be very yeah. difficult. Um, well, the, the the first thing they would try to do in those days was to pull the bullet out, and the doctors were using their fingers reaching mm -hmm. up in the wound to locate it to try to pull it out. And, you know, right away, you know, you you're gonna say like. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Knowing what we know now, yeah. not the best way to go about doing? things. <laughs> but uh, as we know, you know, he was at Ford's Theater. He was watching the play, uh, Our American Cousin, when this happens. The war is over. Of course, he's, you know, probably as happy as he could be at the time. Uh, you know, he, he, I think he even asks that he says he doesn't need his guard. You know, the war is over. Uh, but fate will have it. John Wilkes Booth pulls the trigger. 
And at that time, they decide to take him across the street uh, to, to, you know, do some, to, to examine him medically. And one of the gentlemen that helped carry him across the street uh, has ties to Pittsburgh, and that is uh, Jacob Souls, who uh, we're seeing here in this photo, right, Mike? Yeah. Um, Jacob Souls was a Pittsburgh guy. He uh, was a member of Thompson's Battery, Independent Battery, Pennsylvania Light Artillery. Um, he joined late in the war. He didn't have a lot of experience in, in battle. You know, he just was a uh, uh, happened to be um, the battery happened to be stationed in Pittsburgh. I mean, sorry, in Washington um, at the end of the war. And uh, Souls and his uh, two buddies, uh, Jacob Griffiths and John Corey, were kind of like hanging around town celebrating. And they went to Ford's Theater and they were able to get in to see the play. And that was uh, our American cousin um, that was playing. And it was the performance that the president and his wife were at. Um, and when the shot rang out um, in the middle of the play, uh, they, uh, first of all, Mary Lincoln screamed, of course, and um, some people rushed to the box and um, they decided to get him out of there and carry him across the street to the Peterson house. And uh, they needed some strong people to do that. And uh, Souls was there. Uh, Corey and uh, Sample and uh, um, uh, and Griffiths. There were four of them that were from from um, Thompson's Battery, and there were five that carried them, I believe. And but those four were involved, and they carried them from Ford's Theater across the street and laid them in a, in a bed at the Peterson House. Now those guys, of course, didn't stick around and um, see what happened, but they were. Um, really the last people to, to carry uh, Lincoln and they were uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh kids. So this is a, a picture of Jacob Souls as an old man. Um, he lived in McKeesport and um, was a coal miner. Uh, he lost an eye in a, in a coal mining accident. Uh, we have a few things of his, his uh, enlistment papers, some of these pictures of him later in life. Um, but, you know, to think, and some newspaper accounts about uh, what he witnessed um, and what his thoughts were about the assassination. And, you know, just kind of really interesting to think that he was just a local kid at the kind of the right place at the, at a bad time. Yeah. And uh, also in our building, we have um, these bronze plaques on the wall that list all the uh, Allegheny County soldiers uh, from the civil war, the, the 25,000 or so, um, basically the reason soldiers and sailors was built. It was in the, the honor of these individuals and it kind of conveniently, uh, by no nothing on purpose, but right across really from the Lincoln exhibit is Thompson's Batteries plaque. Uh, you can see on the left there is a, a photo of the entire uh, the entire plaque, uh, Pennsylvania Light Artillery, Independent Battery C, Thompson's. And then on the right is a blown up uh, of that plaque to Jacob Souls' name uh, with uh, Samuel Souls, which, you know, is that his brother by chance or do you, you, know? Um, you know, I don't know. I would assume it is. Yeah, you'd have to assume, yeah, that it was. But mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to, to point that out that, you know, his name appears there. Uh, and uh, so does the other Allegheny yeah. County men uh, all around our building. It's a it's a major feature, of course, of soldiers and sailors are these names on these plat bronze plaques all around the outside wall of the first floor. Yeah. The other men who carried the body or, or Lincoln over are also on that plaque as well. All right, and that's going to bring us to uh, one of the last things we have here, which is the uh, the Medal of Honor. And uh, the the reason we decided to, to touch on this real quick is is kind of twofold. First of all, Lincoln was vital to you know signing into law. You know, Congress signed it into law, and Lincoln you know carried out the law of uh, authorizing the Medal of Honor in December of 1861. And this was the first medal that was issued to anyone for you know valor or deeds on the battlefield, a uh, little bit different maybe than what we think of the Medal of Honor today. And, and a good example is the version that we have of this medal, right? We have an actual Medal of Honor, this this version from the Civil War that uh, was issued to Charles Higby, right, Michael? Yeah, this is known as like the first pattern. And yeah, the legislation went in in 61, but the medals really didn't um, start to be issued till late in the war. Um, and um, you know, we think of the Medal of Honor, and it is a very prestigious uh, 
medal, the highest recognition of gallantry that, that we give. And since it was a, a new award at the time, uh, there really was no bar or definition for what, what it took to receive a medal. Um, and for the most part, many of the first medals were given for uh, capturing a flag or turning in a, a battle flag. So there are quite a number of medals. In fact, Higby's medal simply in his citation says capture of a flag. And we know he was in the Appomattox campaign and we know a number of flags were captured. First Pennsylvania Cavalry. We don't know what uh, flag he did capture or what circumstances, but he did get one and he got it. Um, he got it before mustering out of the army in 1865. A number of these medals were presented to um, for flag captures. Um, there were a lot of medals that were, um, that were uh, uh, given to um, um, African-American soldiers um, uh, late in the war, Chaffin's Farm, um, the, number of, the number of battles where they were cited for gallantry and they received medals. Um, and the Medal of Honor, uh, uh, because it wasn't really defined, the door was kind of open and for years afterwards, um, people who who would like read about the medal, who were veterans and who were, you know, brave in their own right, would say, "Well, gosh, I was mentioned in a report for gallantry. You know, I was at I was at uh, charge at Winchester, and I I I should get a medal." Hmm. So they would petition Congress, and and there'd be a minor uh, look through the records, and they would say, "Oh, yeah, okay, this is we'll give him a medal." And people who were politically co connected. Not, uh, many times would would uh, would put themselves in for a medal. So in the Civil War, there are approximately Civil War veterans from 1865 to 1902. About 1,500 medals of honor were uh, were issued by Congress. And when you look at the total medal number of medal of honors today, it's about 3,000. But you get that 1,500 are all Civil mm -hmm. War. Right. And then they raised the bar and what it would take to um, to uh, to be a, a, a recipient. And uh, uh, I see Rich just popped in. Thanks for saving me with that fact, Rich. Uh, Chaffin's Farm, 14 black U.S. Army soldiers for the Medal of Honor, uh, the most in any single engagement for the United States Colored Troops. So that thanks, Rich. That's uh, just what I needed. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, the Higby Medal, which uh, we have in our collection, is in a one of seven that we have in our collection. You mm -hmm. can see, uh, always, I always use as my backdrop for this program uh, some of the medals. These aren't the you're not seeing the the Higby one behind me here, but uh, we do have seven medals of honor in our collection. They are really treasures of our collection, and something that when I always say, well, if you haven't been to Soldiers and Sailors in a while, you're missing out. This is a relatively new exhibit that we have. These seven in the beautiful display cases in our Hall of Valor. Uh, so if, like I keep saying, if you haven't been here in a while, there's, there's a great way, to, a great reason to come back because there's not often you get to see seven medals of honor that span Civil War all the way through the Vietnam War, um, you know, as far as, you know, all in one place that you can visit all at the same time. Yeah, and you can see the different patterns that the medal went through. So it's also very interesting to see how it changed over time. And then... If we have any questions, uh, I, I see that, you know, we've got some great comments. Uh, Rich followed up there about the, uh, the the Alexander Kelly and James Bronson, who are two members of our Hall of Valor that were a part of that uh, Chaffin's Farm uh, battle that saw the uh, 14 Medals of Honor issued to black soldiers. Um, and in the meantime, as I always like to do at the end of the program here, if you want to learn more about Soldiers and Sailors, first of all, always visit our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org. Um, we are open to business Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Guided tours are available by appointment only, so you have to call ahead to get a guided tour. But even if you just want to come and walk through on your own, I really recommend always checking our website before you visit. Because uh, sometimes we do have to close for a private event or something like that, and we always make sure to post that on our website. So always, before you, you, you make the trip down, just double check our website before you come. Or if you want a guided tour, just call ahead and we can set that up for you. Uh, our next Tabletop Gamers uh, event is coming up this Saturday, uh, February 10th. As uh, many of you may know, I talk about this every month. We have a monthly Tabletop Gamers Club that meets at Soldiers and Sailors. It plays military-themed miniature games and board games. It's meant for really all ages, kind of 10 and up, I think is what we say. 
and uh, it's a great chance to to get out and and talk history and and play some games and and as I always like to say, get away from the screens for a little while. And uh, I know that's kind of hypocritical. Here we are staring at our screens this evening, but uh, that's what I love about that program. So if you know any gamers out there, anybody who's interested in historical gaming, even if they are really just you know new to it, uh, we're just a beginner, uh, you're all are welcome at our gaming club. And it takes place one Saturday each month, all day long. This So this month will be uh, uh, this Saturday, February 10th. And the focus, the theme of this is the Kazarine Pass. So I know there's some some pretty cool miniature games getting set up for that. Also, at the end of February here, we'll have our African-American Heritage Celebration. That'll be on February 29th at 7 p.m. Um, and then this year, we'll focus on With Valor We Served, A History of Sacrifice and Fighting for Freedom. We'll be looking at African-American soldiers really through all conflicts and specifically looking at some of the, uh, the heroes, these individuals that rose above and beyond. So... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we touch on Alexander Kelly or a James Bronson or something like that, uh, one of those individuals that Rich mentioned from the Civil War. Um, and it's a, a program, this is the program we do every year, our African American Heritage Celebration. We did name it after John Ford a few years ago. John Ford was a colleague of Michael and I that worked at Soldiers and Sailors uh, and really started our African American Heritage uh, program. And uh, he passed away a few years ago. And we wanted to honor him and all his efforts uh, and, and his time at Soldiers and Sailors. So it is officially now the John L. Ford Senior African American Heritage Celebration. And you can watch that on the regular channels here that you're watching today on either YouTube or Facebook. It will be available on February 29th at 7 p.m. Um, and then finally, for next month, Spotlight On will be on March 14th, 2024. And we will be looking at saluting women in the military. Of course, March is Women's History Month. And women have been uh, played many different roles in our military and soldiers and sailors certainly has some very interesting artifacts and stories related to women in the military. And we'll be highlighting those next month for our spotlight on on March 14th. So I uh, really hope to see you there on next month. I hope to see you there for African-American heritage at the end of this month. And I hope to see you just at soldiers and sailors sometime. Uh, and I encourage you all to come and visit us. And with that, Michael, uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And we're going to go ahead and, and sign off at this time. So good night, everybody, and uh, right. take care.